Blog Talk Radio. Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. I'm William Bell, and with me is Dr. Don Preston. How are you doing, Don? I am very well, William. It's good to be back with you uh, after being gone uh, again, last week, uh, to be with my wife uh, for her follow-up testing and consultations concerning her breast cancer. Everything went exceptionally well. We're very, very pleased with the way things are progressing at this time. And needless to say, we're thankful to the Lord for the way things are going. Well, very good. I'm glad to hear the great news and just hope that Jan continues to progress and that she will um, be comforted. I know that there's been a lot of stress on you with all the going back and forth and the time that it takes to do that. And so we're grateful to hear that good news. Uh, I also read on Facebook that Lance is facing some challenges now uh, and has to have surgery. So our prayers are going out for him as well and hope that he gets some immediate relief from the pain that he's uh, experiencing. And so that, you know, I'm sure just gives you more things to worry about and to be concerned about. But uh, <laughs> we pray for you because you got a lot of burdens on your shoulder uh, to carry at this time. Well, it's just that that's the way life is. You know, we're not we're not told that we would be given any miraculous relief from the the stresses and the and the regular toils and, and challenges of life. And so uh, the the good thing about it is our faith in the Lord uh, sustains us at all times. And you know, Lance's situation is very very stressful. I will say that um, it's been almost two years. ago. Uh, now since he was injured and ruptured a disc in his neck and they did the one surgery the doctor was very optimistic said the surgery went exceptionally well but then he just didn't get any relief from the pain Uh, it just didn't get him better at all and finally he started going back to the doctor and they ran the cat scans the mris the what have you and discovered, lo and behold, that, uh, I mean, it's just incredible. The doctor said that Lance's uh, immune system must be off the scale because hmm. when the uh, when the cadaver bone disconnected and lost its connection with his vertebrae, his body actually absorbed that cadaver bone, literally ate it. And uh, he showed us the other day a CAT scan, and there were only two little bitty white dots where that cadaver bone was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was just literally gone. And so, anyway, this time around, they're going to take a totally different approach. They're going to go in, in the back of his neck. They're going to basically split his neck completely open, and they're going to go in and put, uh, put screws in and Wire, wire those uh, connections together. He will lose a tremendous amount <clears throat> of mobility, uh, won't be able to turn his neck at all. And so, uh, of course, now, obviously the main thing. that long term? Um, that is permanent. In terms of, that is permanent. Oh, wow. Yeah, it is permanent. There's no, uh, <clears throat> there's no prognosis. There's no expectation. There's no really... 
<coughs> pardon me, <coughs> there's no hope for the neck to get better. And so it's just something he's going to have to live with for the rest of his life. He's only 34 years old. So it's uh, it's been very, very difficult on him, needless to say, and, and of course, difficult for mom and dad as well. So uh, <clears throat> we're just hoping and praying that he can get some relief from the pain because he he has been in pain virtually 24 hours a day, uh, just no relief whatsoever. So we we do ask and solicit uh, for prayers from everyone that uh, that the surgery will go well and that he'll be at least pain free. That's what we're hoping. Uh, if he can be pain free. He can put up with the loss of mobility. He can put up with the loss of functionality uh, as long as he can live without being in constant pain for 24 hours a day. Yeah, well, we hope and pray that that is the case, and we'll keep him in constant prayer. Um, uh, You know, and I'll also just be hopeful that, you know, a lot of times the doctors won't, uh, they, they just reserve giving you any glimpse of, how positive things can be, but we know from experience right. that, you know, they said uh, the worst could happen, but, you know, you, you end up, because they told me when my foot was, was busted all the pieces that uh, I'd never run again. Well, I can't run fast, I can't run, but I can run. <laughs> and uh, and so I'm grateful for that. Um, and uh, we hope that, um, that, you know, he'll get a lot more out of uh, the surgery, um, you know, in addition to the relief of pain, but also some mobility back in back in his neck, and I'm sure, um, you know, God is able to do that. So we're we're grateful and hopeful that uh, that will happen. But yes, a lot of a lot of things going on. I just wanted to take a moment also to um, uh, express, you know, further uh, condolences to um, some great friends and brothers of mine, uh, Theo Jenkins and uh, Jana Coleman, Gary. Um, uh, Davis and others from the Progressive Church in South Carolina. You know, I went there this past weekend to uh, attend the funeral of their minister, who has been uh, a great support of our work, and uh, he's been both a student and a teacher. But um, just a brilliant man and um, uh, great, great influence uh, among uh, his um, organization. But you know, started to study the Preterist view years ago. And, of course, he's helped us put on seminars. He's uh, helped support us. He's bought our books and read our books and, uh, t- you know, has helped his congregation to learn and actually faced a lot of opposition from his own uh, brethren in that movement and was still fighting that battle even up to the time that he died. And so I just wanted to, um, you know, say, and of course, he had a beautiful celebration, but I wanted to just you know, further express my condolences to them because it was a tremendous loss uh, for them, and um, he's meant a lot and and just showed how the universality of our message um, extends beyond all borders. And we could just name, you know, um, denominational background after denominational background of all the bridges that we're crossing and the kind of unity that this is bringing about you know, in people understanding these truths, which is leading them to understand other truths. And I remember some years ago, you know, Max used to talk about unity, and he said, brethren, I'm more concerned about the unity of the spirit than, you know, the kind of unity that a lot of people talk about. And um, and you can see that happening. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge them um, and uh, acknowledge that uh, true friendship and relationship with um, uh, J.D. Williams, Pastor J.D. Williams, as he was affectionately called. And I know you know him well and, you know, also interacted with him. And um, like I said, just a tremendous um, tremendous loss for them, but also a tremendous influence. And, you know, when you look at what he did, he was a, he was a really great man. He had some accomplishments that I wasn't even aware of. It was just amazing. Well, you, you beat me to mentioning that situation. Uh, Jana had called me last week, I guess it was. Um, I lose track of time so easily with all the, uh, everything going on with Jan, but uh, Jana did call and told me uh, that just really shocking news. I was just so terribly saddened by that. As you mentioned, I did know uh, Brother Williams. He he 
was just a great guy. I mean, just a wonderful man. He absolutely loved the Lord and his word and loved to share it. And as you mentioned, had a tremendous influence there on his fellowship. Uh, so many people there and uh, obviously influence uh, with Theo and Jaina uh, and just just their whole fellowship. And it, it's a tremendous loss. We just hate it so bad. I would have given anything to have been able to attend the funeral, but obviously I was in Tulsa with Jan. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, things things like that happen uh, in in our life. We lose people that we uh, have a great deal of affection and uh, and care for. That's just uh, that's just the way life is. But we certainly do send out our condolences to the group there and uh, give them our love, our condolences, and our appreciation to everything that um, the brother Williams and you know uh, you and I both know that Theo and Jana. And others are carrying on that work to the very best of their ability. They're doing a great, great job. We just appreciate them so very, very much. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, we've got business at hand to take care of today, so I guess it's time to roll up our sleeves and go to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the Power 2017 lectures were presented by the South Haven Church of Christ in South Haven, Mississippi, just a few miles away from where I live, and um, there was uh, there were you know several messages. I think I missed the one that we're going to review today, um, and uh, did not get a chance to see it live, so I had to listen to it. And um, I thought I was going to miss <laughs> on being here almost because you know Skype decides to update, and I couldn't Uh-oh. get signed <laughs> in, so I had to dial in on the phone. But um, <laughs> we managed to get in. But at any rate, um, he did a lesson on the parable of the virgins. This is Mike Benson, uh, a lesson which I thought, you know, as far as information was concerned, was a good lesson. It was well delivered in terms of some of the information. However, you know, it's just like pretty much every lesson that was delivered there, uh, filled with some flaws uh, with respect to the end time. And, of course, you know, their uh, premise was to demonstrate the end of time. Uh, as I've said before, uh, not very much said about that at all other than mentioning it, but in terms of proof and establishing it, uh, there was a tremendous void uh, throughout every single lecture uh, in that attempt. And, of course, we knew going in that uh, that was a proposition that was unprovable, that could not be proven. And it stands even today as an unprovable one. But nevertheless, um, you know, I would have loved to have seen a, a real, you know, schoolboy attempt at um, at trying to establish it. But it was just pretty much assumed in all of the presentations. But uh, this particular uh, presentation was on the parable of the virgins in Matthew chapter 25. And even as I think about that and think about you, I know... <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hard to hold you back, uh, um, especially with all that you've studied about the wedding feast and and all that's there that we can talk about on this particular subject. Um, you know, he of course he had you know his his basic uh, three points that he was uh, dealing with. I think uh, he had something about the the bridegroom's delay uh, or bridegroom delayed bride bride maids or something like that dismayed. And uh, I can't remember yes. the last one, but it was the third one. Did uh, you get that? And d- displayed but, the br- the bridegroom displayed. Displayed. That's what it was. Displayed. And uh, but within that, he had some he had some some good points um, that I thought were uh, some you know really nice little um, nuggets of information that can uh, help us to understand the parable better. But with regard to the time and setting. Uh, I thought that's where it got butchered, along with some of the um, the uh, typological applications of the uh, the wedding. And so we want to uh, talk about that today. Uh, I'm just going to start out with um, mentioning the fact that when he started his his presentation, he made a reference to Dr. Dow Flat of uh, Fried Hardeman, uh, one of his professors of years ago. And I had Dr. Flat actually sent me a letter inviting me to attend, uh, and a a scholarship offer, actually, to attend Fried Hardeman, which um, I didn't take it at that time. Um, 
I wanted to, but I was, you know, working and taking care of a family uh, for the most part uh, because of my eschatological views, and had it not been for for that, I would have jumped on the opportunity. But at any rate, um, uh, he mentioned that one of the things that uh, Dr. Flatt told him was that we should read the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, from first century eyes rather than 21st century eyes. And, of course, you and I, you know, wholeheartedly, and pretty much every preterist that I know that's a full preterist, wholeheartedly ascribe to that hermeneutic. As a matter of fact, it wasn't long ago that, um, you know, you presented some uh, outstanding lessons on hermeneutics uh, from that perspective. We tend to call it audience relevance. And I thought, you know, when he said that, you know, it, it would be good that if that principle were followed all the way through, but it didn't take long for it to unravel because even though he uh, said we should look at it through first century eyes, most of his applications were 21st century applications. Uh, I mean, not one application that actually placed that event within the time of the first century. And I'm reminded, you know, as you know, and uh, attended as you were my moderator in that debate with Stephen Wiggins, you know, he chided us for having um, first century applications of these events, and particularly he, he brought his brand of Halloween costume AD 70 <laughs> glasses to mock us <laughs> in that discussion. And, of course, then I created a chart where I had um, – uh, AD or, or rather, AD, yeah, AD 70 glasses for his Holy Spirit view, which uh, kind of um, unraveled his little um, little <laughs> party that he was trying to have because you know he was uh, actually in the same boat and um, a worse one for his position. At least we were consistent and he was inconsistent. But at any rate, that's kind of the idea uh, where where I saw him start. So I'm going to uh, let you uh, begin where you would like, and then we'll just kind of push through and. See where this goes. Um, maybe we'll do a couple of messages on this because I know it's, I mean, the wedding feast and all of this is just full of information. Yeah. Take it from there. No joke. Well, I think you did a great job of pointing out. Basically, his his lesson started out, as, as you suggested, on a high note. And, yes. and by the way, I agree with you. It was well presented. Uh, he he was fairly well organized. He's a, he's a good speaker. Uh, certainly... Uh, I would say a little bit above average of of a speaker, so I appreciated that. <clears throat> and so yeah, and when he started to be a very out, good student. yes, he did. Uh, <clears throat> he brought out some details about first century Jewish wedding practices that, quite frankly, I haven't read, and I was I was thrilled when I re- heard yeah. some of. Uh, of the details, some of the background information. You know, I I try to read and try to learn about first century and ancient Jewish wedding practices uh, because they do, even as he said, they open our eyes for understanding and appreciating the biblical text. But while he started out on that and says that Brother Dow flat urged us to read the bible through first century eyes then as you suggested he very quickly departed from that and all of a sudden he de- he completely and totally departs from the first century context and acts as if while jesus was using first century customs practices idioms etc that really honestly he was expecting his audience to be thinking of 21st century people. Not themselves, but 21st century, or who knows, 41st century people when, (laughs) according to him, it is all said and done. You know, he did ask the audience at one time, he said, Jesus could come today, couldn't he? You know, you remember that? That's right. Uh, (laughs) I thought, well, Uh, well, you know, my first reaction to that was, well, where is the man of sin and the temple, et cetera? But anyway, go ahead. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Uh, I mean, all sorts of things went through my mind when he said Jesus could actually come today. I also found it interesting when he said, amen, and nobody said amen. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so he goes, amen, and 
there's a little faint amen or two, you know, back in the audience. <laughs> you know, uh, he's supposedly preaching to an audience that is there to affirm the the end of the world and the second coming of Christ to refute coveted eschatology, and none of them want to affirm that Jesus could have, could come today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just found that interesting, but nonetheless, my my first initial reaction when he started talking about we must read the Bible through first century eyes, my initial reaction to that was that's only partially true. We must read the Bible through ninth century Jewish eyes. And why is that? Because I pose the following question. And we, we try to get people to see this constantly. If you're going to properly interpret any given text, you absolutely must set the proper context. It's not enough <clears throat> on its own to say let's read it through the first century eyes now I would agree with that if we understand that the first century Jewish eyes was incorporating the ninth century or the eighth century excuse me mm-hmm. uh, Jewish Israeli view but he certainly we, he did not allude one single time that would give us in any way to any material, any ideas that would answer the question, whose wedding is this anyway? And he would answer that question, well, it's the wedding between Christ and the church. Well, that's partially correct, but we have to go back beyond that. And we have to see that as Isaiah 54 said, speaking to Israel, I am your husband, you are my wife. To whom was Yahweh married in the first place? And the unequivocal answer, it was Israel. Now, the ten northern tribes divorced themselves, pun intended, from the two southern tribes. To your tents, O Israel, for we have no part in David. That was said in Second Kings chapter 11. Second Kings chapter 17. So the ten northern tribes divorced themselves from Judah and Benjamin. And they went their way. Now Yahweh had not divorced them, but in Hosea chapter 2... After 230 years of the divided kingdom, and Israel's, that is the ten northern tribes, Israel's repeated increasing rebellion and sin, Yahweh finally said, write her, the ten northern tribes, a bill of divorcement. For I am not her husband, and she is not my wife. That's Hosea chapter 2, 1 and 2. Now, I absolutely did not hear Brother Benson even mention how Israel had been married to God and how Israel, through sin, was divorced by Yahweh. And he certainly did not mention the fact that in Hosea chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, the Lord said, that he would make a new covenant, a covenant of peace for Israel. And it would be in that time, he said, I will betroth you to myself again in righteousness. I will betroth you to myself forever. Brother Benson did not mention one single word about the fact that Jesus came to Confirm the promises made to the fathers, and that the that the promise of the of the wedding is the promise of the remarriage between God and all twelve tribes.
tribes. Now, we don't have time that, this evening to develop any, any kind in-depth discussion of the fact that while Yahweh divorced the ten northern tribes in 721 B.C. by t sending them off into, uh, into Assyrian captivity, he could not divorce Judah and Benjamin because Messiah was to come through Judah. However, he did say in Hosea chapter 6, verses 7 through 11, that the time was coming in which Judah would receive the same kind of harvest, i.e. the same kind of judgment, that the ten northern tribes had received. Well, what kind of judgment and harvest did the ten northern tribes get? They were divorced. And Yahweh said the time was coming in which Judah would receive that identical kind of harvest, the identical kind of judgment. <coughs> in other words, the Lord would ultimately divorce the two southern tribes as well. Now, again, I, I, you know, it takes a lot of time to fully develop this. But this is some of the most fascinating and most significant material. And let me give a little bit of an anecdote here, if I might, William. Way back in about 70, 1976, 77, I believe that was the time frame, maybe 78, I was studying with a young man that was, uh, well, he was about my age. Uh, I was young back then, too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, he was a preacher for a Pentecostal church in town. And we were studying twice a week. We were studying on the charismata and, and what have you. He uh, called me up one day, and he said, hey, Don, I want you to attend uh, a revival that we're having. We got this preacher coming into town. And I want you to come and listen to him. Well, I, I, I guess I paused, and he said, Now, look, Don, I know that you know what most Pentecostal preachers are like. They don't engage in exegesis. It's more emotionalism and, and a lot of hype. Now, this is the way he was describing Pentecostal preachers, and he was one. But he said, This guy is different. This guy is all about exegesis. And I said, Well... Okay, and he was a, you know, this this preacher was a good friend of mine, and I said, well, Cliff, sure, I'll 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 be willing to come and listen. And he preached on Hosea, and I went up to him after the sermon, introduced myself, and obviously my friend had already told him who I was, but he said, I really appreciate you being here, and I I told him then. I feel exactly the same way today. But I said, that is the finest lesson on Hosea I have ever heard in my life. And I, I had heard Church of Christ preachers preach on it, not in depth, and it didn't even come close to matching what he did. But that lesson, that sermon by that Pentecostal preacher stoked my fires to understand God's marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And down through the years, I have studied, I have refined, I have developed my thoughts and my thinking on this entire issue. And it is one of the most important issues in Jesus' teaching. It is one of the most important eschatological issues in the entire New Testament. And the marriage issue, the marriage doctrine, is absolutely, inextricably, 100% bound up with God's Old Covenant promises made to Old Covenant Israel. And yet, here was Brother Mike Benson, talking about the so-called end of time and talking about the marriage in Matthew chapter 25. And he did not so much as mention that God had been married to Israel. He divorced Israel. He promised to one day divorce Judah, but then he would remarry the reconstituted, uh, restored, revived and re-identified, if you please, Israel. It would, it would then be comprised 
of the righteous remnant of oh pardon me of old covenant Israel after the flesh it would then be inclusive likewise of Gentiles pagans coming in to create a new man a new body not one word from brother from our brother Benson and yet <clears throat> I'm confident that he and the majority of his audience felt that he did a great job expounding on Matthew chapter 25. And yet, in my estimation, he completely ignored the true context. Well, he started his sermon out by saying, we, we have to read the New Testament through first century eyes. So the question is, and he even asked the question during his lesson, did he not, William, when he said, who was Jesus talking to? And he said he was talking to Jews. Right. Okay. Brother Benson, Jesus was not talking to the church after Pentecost. He was, And he was not talking to the church at Corinth, although he could have been, since the church at Corinth was established in a synagogue, and was comprised of Jews who knew God's old covenant promises that in the last days he would remarry Israel. And Paul said to the church at Corinth, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Where did the promise of the last day's betrothal come from? Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 and yet, once again, not a word from Brother Benson about the connections between the church at Corinth being established in the synagogue, just like the church at Antioch of Pisidia and Derby and Lystra and wherever, where Paul went first of all to the synagogues and preached to the Jew first and then to the Greeks. And he preached to them about God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. And yet, once again, here we have Brother Benson. I, I, I really liked his demeanor, William. I really did. I bet he's a great guy to know. And yet... Yeah, I picked that up as well. And yet, not a word, folks. Not one single word from Brother Benson about this contextual background, contextual source for Jesus' discussion of the marriage, <clears throat> speaking to a Jewish audience whose eschatological hope was the restoration of Israel, whose eschatological hope was the resurrection. And oh, by the way, folks, guess what? In Hosea... The hope of the remarriage was the hope of the resurrection. In Hosea, Hosea breaks itself down into some really cool, neat uh, categories. There is, first of all, the departure, or excuse me, the divorce, Hosea chapter 2. The Lord said, write her a bill of divorcement. Number two, divor uh, departure, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. In divorcing her, the Lord said, I will go away. I will return to my place until they repent and they return to me. So there's departure. And there's death. Again, Hosea chapter 5, 13 through the end of the chapter, chapter 6, uh, verse 5 and 6, I have stricken them, I have slain them with the words of the prophets. In chapter 5, he said, I have torn them as a young lion tears its victim and none can recover. There's death. So you have, in Hosea, you have divorce, departure, and death. Well, guess what? That death was not biological death of individual people. It was the corporate body of Israel that God killed by sending them into Assyrian captivity. Oh, but then comes the gracious part of Hosea. God said he would remarry her. Hosea chapter 2, verse 19. And he said he would return to her. I will go to my place. I will depart, 
and return to my place until they depart from me. And in Hosea chapter 6, he will come to us as the dew of the morning. And then, Hosea chapter 6, he has slain us. But on the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. So, you have divorce, departure, and death. But in contrast, you have the marvelous and the gracious promise of God that in the last days, Hosea chapter 3, 3 to 5, the Lord would do what? Remarry her, he would return to her, and he would resurrect her. Folks, it's not a literal, may I use the term physical, marriage. It's not a literal physical return. And it's certainly not a literal, physical resurrection. It's a corporate body resurrection of the body of Israel, separated from God due to sin. And, boy, when we come to the New Testament, again, we see Paul saying, I have betrothed you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then if we can correlate that, and I think we can, to what Paul said in Romans chapter 11, verse 10, Uh, Seven, excuse me. Israel has not attained that for which she sought, he sought, but the elect has attained it, and the rest were blinded. Well, that blindness was a part of the judicial blindness as a result of her sin, as a result of her rebellion, uh, as Paul would express it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, God would... God would blind the eyes of those who refuse to see. And so it's important to to see that concept. But again, the point of it is, what was Israel's hope? Well, you can speak of Israel's hope under an awful lot of headings, but you can speak of Israel's hope under the imagery of the wedding. You can speak of Israel's hope as the return of the Lord. You can speak of Israel's hope as the resurrection which would be the restoration and would be the remarriage. And here is Paul, who preached nothing but the hope of Israel, saying, I have betrothed you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. The imagery here is awesome. It speaks of a wonderful personal relationship between God and his people and intimacy that is to be found in Christ because God kept his promises to Israel, corporate Israel. He called, for instance, on the day of Pentecost, you have Jews, you have devout men out of every nation under heaven. William, do you suppose there were some of the diaspora that were there that day? Oh, absolutely. And here Peter calls. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, according to Acts 2, uh, there certainly were. I mean, they were from every nation uh, out of heaven, and some of those nations that were represented there were nations where Israel had been scattered as the diaspora. Exactly right. So on that day of Pentecost, you have essentially the 12 tribes of Israel represented there, but they're a righteous remnant that obeys the gospel that day, and they're added to the body of Christ. They're added to the number of the disciples of Christ, who is the Messiah. What's the Messiah to do? Marry Israel. And yet, all of this, once again, not so much is mentioned by Brother Benson. Now, I I, I want to say this, and I say this in all kindness, I appreciate the fact that a couple of different times in his lesson, he said, Brother, let me lovingly say, and so I appreciate that. So let me say, with all kindness and respect, to Brother Benson, and about Brother Benson, unless and until Brother Benson is willing to incorporate his doctrine of 
the remarriage or the marriage of Christ in Matthew chapter 25, unless he's willing to join that, and pun intended, unless he's willing to marry that to the Old Testament doctrine of the remarriage of Israel in the last days, then he cannot hope to say that he has properly exegeted Matthew chapter 25. He has completely divorced it, again pun intended, from its roots, from its fountain. Pardon pardon me. Wow, that came out of nowhere. From its theological source. Well, if you if you divorce any subject, I don't care if it's the wedding, I don't care if it's baptism, I don't care if it's the church. I don't care if if it's the Holy Spirit. I don't care what the subject is. If you divorce it from its theological fountain, its theological source, and its theological foundation, you are not going to properly present the doctrine of uh, of that issue. And that is precisely what Brother Benson did, again, with all due respect and appreciation, for the way that he presented himself. When a man goes through an entire presentation on a doctrine that is so theologically critical to eschatology and does not so much as mention the source and the foundation of that doctrine, you know that something is tragically and fundamentally wrong. And yet that's precisely what he did. William, your additional thoughts there. Well, uh, I think you have um, expressed that very, very clearly and uh, you know, cited the Old Testament background for the marriage, the betrothal, and the connection with the resurrection. And all the while I'm sitting listening uh Something else keeps, you know, pounding in my head as you're speaking about that, and especially as it relates to establishing the setting and background of Matthew 25 and the wedding, and that is Israel's feast days, which (laughs) take you back even further. And I know that that has to be, you know, top of mind for you as well. But uh, when you talk about uh, the wedding feast and uh, and the marriage, etc., uh, you are dealing with Israel's festal calendar, and particularly it is the Feast of Trumpets, which is alluded to in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, and it has some very, very uh, significant uh, elements that Brother Benson actually touched on, but as you said, he never really developed the source of where they are. And as a matter of fact, one of the aspects of the Feast of Trumpets uh, is its relationship to the marriage, to the shout, to trumpets and resurrection, um, is also the fact that it was considered the unknown day. And he spoke about the time that was unknown. And, uh, and, and, you know, as we talked about Keith Ritchie's lesson last week, uh, that day and hour, I think um, you were not with me, but that was uh, Daniel Rogers. We talked about it uh, a little bit. But that feast day was known as the unknown day. And this is where, as you say, having that historical frame of reference from which we need to launch our um, – rockets of in, of interpretation, you know, to have the right lunching pad uh, has to be out of that Old Testament Jewish context because that was Jesus' audience. And they would have immediately and readily understood, as they did, all of the references that were made in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 uh, regarding the feast day. And so, for example, just some of the names of the Feast of Trumpets, and it had several names. Of course, 
you know, it was referred to as the day of the Lord. Well, who would deny that Matthew 25 is the day of the Lord and uh, was the time of Jacob's trouble? It was considered as the day of the awakening blast. Well, I mean, to me, that just has all kinds of connotations <laughs> of awakening the dead at the sound of the trumpet, uh, tying right back into, you know, your um, exegesis on uh, Hosea 5 and 6 that tied the wedding into the concept of resurrection. And by the way, when you did speak of that, you know, you spoke of the fact that it was, you know, on the third day, and that's precisely where Paul gets his resurrection doctrine in first corinthians 15 when he says uh he was raised the third day according to the scriptures he's citing hosea uh chapter six and you've done uh, you know excellent work in that particular area as well but it was also called the yom hadin or and don't ask me if i'm pronouncing these words correctly uh, you know i'm probably <laughs> butchering them to death but uh the day of judgment the opening of the books and the opening of the gates and this ties in passages like Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 20, because both of those chapters are all about the opening of the books. Well, the Day of Trumpets, or the Feast of Trumpets, uh, incorporated that concept as well, because the Feast of Trumpets was uh, a part of Israel's festal calendar the fall, um, in the fall season, where uh, everything was about to be wrapped up for their harvest year, and thus the end of the harvest. There are more connotations with this with this wedding terminology uh, that's involved. And by the way, while I'm on the feast days, uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to Daniel Rogers' presentation in, um, in Michigan, Ludington, uh, on the feast days, he did just a bang-up job, just an excellent job on presenting some things and brought out you know some very, very key points. Um, but did a, did a great job, and I recommend people to listen to that on Labor Not in Vain, where he has both the audio and I believe his charts as well um, from that um, available for you. I've already been sharing it and spreading it uh, around the Internet with people. But um, So that was a part of uh, that time, and then it was called the Yum Harkessa, or Harkessa. I Again, you know, don't ask me to pronounce these words right. One of these days I'm going to take Hebrew. I'm, I'm scheduled to do that. <laughs> and then I'll have I'll be able to, to speak with authority on these things, or maybe. But that was called the hidden day. Now that's the concept and the context of Matthew twenty four thirty one, which refers to the Feast of Trumpets, and also verse thirty six, which, by the way, when people try to divide Matthew twenty four, there's not a division there. <laughs> Uh, because, and even if you wanted to claim a division, he speaks of the same subject both before and verse 34. Matthew 24, 31 is Matthew 24, 36, because they're both referring to the Feast of Trumpets, which was called the hidden day, the day unknown, the day that was known only to the Lord. Uh, however, here's what they did know. They always knew that it was going to be on the first day of the seventh month, of every year, because those feast days were dress rehearsals for um, the end time, for the fulfillment of all things that relate to the coming of the Lord, and that's what we have in Matthew 25. Uh, it was called the Ha Kedushin, or Nesuin. Um, please forgive me for one of these pronunciations, because I don't know a lick of Hebrew. Uh, but the, the <clears throat> wedding of the Messiah, that day was called the wedding of the Messiah. So when you're talking about no man knows the day and the hour, and these brethren wouldn't have a problem, I'm sure Mike Coleman, uh, I mean uh, Mike, uh, excuse me, not Coleman, but um, um, what was his last name, Benson, wouldn't have a problem understanding that that day and hour, because he alluded to it, is the time of the wedding. But that was the Feast of Trump. This is a Jewish festival that is being kept here, and uh, or that Jesus was talking about. And, uh, and he made all these wonderful references, as you stated earlier, to the uh, Jewish wedding, the feast, the betrothal, and all of these wonderful things that he said that, you know, I felt just like you. I said, man, these are some great gems that he's putting out here. But they just fit right into this category. And then it was called the Ha Melech, the coronation of the Messiah, and uh, indicating that this is the time that 
Christ is uh, at the time of his um, glorification and the consummation of his coronation as king, because as you see in Matthew 25 and verse, uh, what verse is that? The one that I you know, made that statement that you quote a lot. Yeah, uh, then 31 shall he, and following. <laughs> 31 and following. Sit. Then shall he, he sit should. and not quit, as I say. But he would sit upon yep. the throne of his glory. And so rather than um, relinquishing his throne, that is the point of climax in his reign, uh, where he enters into the full glory of that because all of his enemies have been defeated. The kingdom has come in power and judgment, removing and defeating all of his enemies, and therefore he now reigns glorious in that glorious reign. And uh, just like a, a, a boxing um, um, champion has to face all of his contenders before he can be considered the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. You know, he can go around claiming that all day, but if he refuses to fight that number one contender and defeat him, it's always going to be questionable. You know, there will always be doubt as to whether or not he can defeat them. But if he fights them all and conquers them all, then he is declared the undisputed heavyweight champion, and that's a glory that he only gets once he has completed that. And that's the same thing that happens with Christ. So, uh, you know, I wanted to put that in, and I know that, you know, there's so much more we can say if we talk about the feast days, but that is the context of Matthew 25 and that wedding it is the fulfillment of a Jewish festi uh, festi festival, and therefore part of that uh, Jewish calendar, that festival calendar, uh, that fulfills the events of the last days. And one of the things, let me, this is just last point, uh, was the preparation that they would make in view of the coming Day of Atonement, and uh, and then followed by the Feast of Tabernacles. But at any rate, I'm going to just kind of stop there and let you kind of chime in on uh, some of those thoughts because I know you know they probably would um, uh, engender as much commentary from you as as the other did. <laughs> well, <clears throat> everything that you pointed out there is absolutely 100% correct, and it drives home the point that Brother Benson stated at the very first of his lesson that we've already noted. He said, "Read." the Bible through first century eyes. Okay, what William just shared with you is the fact that the first century audience of Jesus would absolutely have understood all of the language, all of the figures of speech, all of these references that Brother Benson alluded to, you know, even in passing, <clears throat> pardon me, that first century audience would have understood them not in some abstract uh, of an event 2,000 years uh, separated from that first century and in a context completely divorced <clears throat> from the observance of the law of Moses, i.e. the feast days, and all of the terminology related to that all of the concepts related to that. And just think about some of the things that William called our attention to. <clears throat> okay? Uh, Alfred Edersheim points out that Rosh Hashanah, which is another name, by the way, for the Feast of Trumpets, that Rosh Hashanah was a day in which the books were open. Well, okay. Uh, guess what? Brother Benson would agree that the coming of the Lord in Matthew chapter 25 is Revelation chapter 20, the time of the opening of the books. Well, okay, but where did the Jews place that? They believed that Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, foreshadowed the time of the, quote, final judgment. So that means, that means, folks, that the Jews expected the fulfillment of their eschatological festal calendar in fulfillment of the Law of Moses – not at the end of the Christian age. This is so incredibly important. And by the way, <clears throat> I just I nearly fell out of my chair when he said, and there's so much more I'd like to get back to, but we're running out of time already. But he, he made the point, and he says, well, you know, today our weddings begin with a song or a prayer, but he oh, yeah. said, 
the way the, <laughs> uh, in the first century, the wedding of the Jews began with a shout. And I thought, Matthew 24, <laughs> 30 through 31. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels with the sound of a trumpet. Oh, by the way, they could also begin weddings with the sound of the trumpet and with the shout of the archangel. Uh, so that, that uh, just quickly brought up, you know, your um, your book uh, on yes. um, we shall meet him in the air at the wedding of the King of Kings. Of course, there's a lot of that terminology that we hadn't gotten to yet as well. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that since you talked about the shout, and uh, that's First Thessalonians five, I mean four, sixteen and seventeen as well. Exactly. You know, uh, every time in the New Testament that we find uh, the shout of the archangel. Uh, I say every time. What's interesting to me is that Matthew chapter 24, a text that Brother Benson would, would almost assuredly uh, apply to the Lord's coming in A.D. 70. It's the Lord's coming to gather his people. It is the Lord's coming with a shout. It is the Lord's coming with the trumpet. Okay. How does he divorce that? pun intended <laughs> how does he divorce that from the wedding of Matthew 25 and it, it it just jumped out at me as I sat and I watched him talk about weddings beginning with trumpets weddings beginning with shout and then completely ignoring Matthew 24 29 to 31 a passage to reiterate that he most assuredly applies to the coming of the Lord in A.D. 70. So <clears throat> was the shout and was the trumpet and the gathering of the elect in Matthew chapter 24, 29 and following, is that completely and totally unrelated to the wedding? Why was he coming? How was he going to gather them? What was the purpose of the shout? What's the purpose of the trumpet? We already know it's for the gathering of the elect. Well, what is the gathering of the elect? Well, the gathering of the elect in the Old Testament, once again, to set our context, uh, and the proper context for understanding the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the gathering of the elect is the regathering of Israel for the wedding, folks. And it is likewise for the resurrection. This is this is Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27. The Lord posed the question through the prophet. Has the Lord, Lord slain him as he has slain those who slew him? Well, the question basically is, has the Lord, Lord slain Israel? And the answer to that is, yes, he has slain Israel. The question is, how? By sending her away. In other words, God killed Israel, a corporate death, by sending her into Assyrian captivity. But what did he promise to do? Well, <clears throat> he promised to save her in the day in which he would destroy Jerusalem. Now, folks, listen to me very carefully. Jerusalem was not destroyed in the time of the Assyrian captivity. Judah and Jerusalem did not go into Assyrian captivity. But Isaiah 27 is talking about the salvation of Israel, i.e. the salvation of the ten northern tribes, in the day in which God would destroy the people whom he had created. He would destroy the city, i.e. Jerusalem, and he would turn the altar of the temple into chalk stones that would crumble at the touch. And yet that would be the day of Israel's salvation. And he said that salvation would be at the time in which, guess what? He would gather Israel, the children of God, scattered abroad, at the sounding of the great trumpet. What's Matthew twenty four thirty one? 
the gathering of the elect at the sounding of the great trumpet. And folks, make, folks, make no mistake, the Jewish rabbis said that Isaiah 27, verse 13, and the sounding of the great trumpet for the gathering of the elect who were scattered to the four winds, the Jewish rabbis said that, was the, that would be the resurrection on the last day. Well, look, folks, we're out of time. <clears throat> we haven't gotten anywhere close to through with Brother Benson's uh, attempt to explain Matthew chapter 25. So we will pick this up, Lord willing, next Tuesday evening. In the meantime, thank you so very, very much for joining us for Two Guys and a Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. And with that, we will say good night and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. <laughs>